Good evening. You're watching The Digital Age, and I'm James Goodale. We've got a great show for you tonight on how the new internet is going to change the world. You may ask what the new internet is. It's called Web 2.0. And we have a great guest to discuss this tonight with us, and that's Ann Nelson. She presently teaches at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, mm -hmm. where she teaches media studies. But that's the smallest part of her resume. She is a book in progress on uh, the pros and cons of Nazi uh, media. Well, uh, I'm anti-Nazi media. Oh, you're anti-Nazi oh, okay. <laughs> anti media. She was at one time the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Okay. Uh, she's written a play, which she wrote in about three or four days, called The Guys, which is a big hit off Broadway. She is uh, very versed in all forms of media. And when we talk to her, she'll explain to us what's going on with Web 2.0. Let's start at the top with uh, someone explaining uh, a little bit about Web 2.0. It'll sort of tantalize you so we can get the full scoop from Ann. Let's watch this video. Dale Daughtery mentioned it during a brainstorming session. Daughtery suggested that the web was in a renaissance with changing rules and evolving business models. It has since come to refer to what some people see as a second phase of architecture and application development for the World Wide Web. Well, that just tantalizes us, Anne, because it doesn't tell us much about Web 2.0. So you tell us. Okay, well, the first phase of the Internet, which is only really a couple of decades old, worked on kind of a publishing model where you have somebody creating a product or website and then the users go in and check in and read it or consume it the way you would with a newspaper or a, a television network. What's happened over the last few years is that it's become more of a two-way operation so that a website is becoming a gathering mechanism. Uh, a classic example is YouTube. YouTube is just an empty framework. The users put in their videos, they watch each other's videos. So rather than having a publisher of content, you have this infinitely renewable cycle where the users now talk to each other. So that's, that's the idea of Web 2.0, and it is changing everything. Well, let me ask, uh, is it changing your life too? Because you have a website, website that's uh, devoted to Web 2.0, isn't that fair to say? My class last fall at Columbia created a wiki, which is a collective. A wiki. Well, wiki is Hawaiian for quick, they say. But it's become an outgrowth of the term Wikipedia, which is another Web 2.0 product where they set up the shell of an encyclopedia and the users fill it in. And then they create collective articles. So let's say that somebody wrote an article about Jim Goodale. One person might write a draft. Somebody else comes in and says, no, you made a mistake there. They correct it. Someone else adds something. And over time, a single article can have an infinite number of authors. So how does that work, that concept work on your website? Well, what we're having on my website, or my class's website, is that all 29 members of the class contributed to this publication. There's not really clear lines of authorship. And so it's a collective product rather than an individual product. And what it does is just walk through different studies of what's going on with the Internet outside the United States, especially in, in poor developing countries. We want to show a couple of those in a second, but let me ask you, since it's a co collaborative effort, does that mean that you as sort of the progenitor have a no editorial control over this whatsoever? Well, given that it's in a university setting and my name is on it, I basically authorized every word in it because uh, one of the issues that arises with this work is accuracy and reliability. And if you have a totally open site where anybody anywhere can put their two cents in, you get a mess. And that's one problem we're dealing with. Um, for example, if you look at YouTube videos and you look at comments from users, a lot of them are just hate speech and obscenity and not very interesting or useful. So the next phase we're dealing with in this world is how you build in some of the gatekeeper and safeguard functions that you've had in print. Well, that's a fascinating question. Maybe we'll come, we'll come back to it. But I've gone on your, your website and I find it uh, fascinating. 
uh, particularly with respect to third world countries because I didn't know that certain countries even had um, vlogs, for example, and I want to show a, a couple of them. And the first one that fascinated me was the one from Iran, mm -hmm. and I want to put it up so we can, sure. we can look at it. Okay, and what that says is, fascist president, polytechnic is not your place. Now, that stunned me. I didn't know Iran had stuff like that on the net. What you have happening all over the world in censored societies is that young people with internet access get around the older conservative censors and they put their own, own content up. Now a lot of times it gets taken down quite quickly. Um, websites get shut down, but there's this enormous cat and mouse game going on in all kinds of places. China, Iran, the Arab countries, it's quite fascinating to watch. Let's, uh, uh, well, let me ask some more about this. How many bloggers are there in Iran? Oh, thousands and thousands. Really? Yeah, absolutely. And it is a way for the Iranians in exile to connect with the young Iranians. Oh, yeah. Let me, uh, explain to me how that works. Okay, let's suppose that we, we had that Iranian one up, okay? Uh -huh. And suppose it's uh, not taken down, but it's walled off, so you can't get mm -hmm. to it if you're in Iran. Does that mean I can't get to it in... Uh, get to that from the United States? Yeah, the government puts up so once various it's gone, firewalls. Once it's gone, it's gone. But so the Iranians uh, in uh, Iran have a chance to talk to the uh, emigres then. Yeah, the through, diaspora. Through the, yeah. Through these back, back and forth. But again, the government puts up firewalls and the young people get around them in about five seconds. Really? So, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so there's not a very effective way to control this content. Uh, let's put a one up from Syria. This is my favorite. Look at that. Okay, that's a, uh, uh, do you want to translate for us? And I'm just kidding. It says on the right-hand side uh, in English, in the household, the man has the final say. He gives orders and physically abuses. The first uh, uh, blog we showed for, from, from Iran was really polit political protest. But this is more of a social protest, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So what's going on in Syria? I'm really surprised to see that this is up. This is, this is an amazing area. Um, I was in, working in Jordan last year with the Annenberg Center and talked to Saudi women who work in computers. There is an entire renaissance of Saudi women's literature because they're able to publish themselves on the internet without leaving home or without taking off their veils. So this is kind of opening up avenues of expression for populations who have not had these in, in our lifetimes. Uh, now, would they get taken down? They... Well, a lot of it is not really, I mean, it may be controversial, it may, it may not be, but the, the question is that women who've not been able to participate in public life, go out in public, speak in public because of these constraints, exist in a new public sphere, which is the internet, and they're able to meet each other without leaving home. I find it fascinating. I have to tell you that uh, two choices for Iranian videos that I actually got from your site mm, mm. are um, or three, three nudie uh, Iran women who are deciding to flaunt whatever, uh, having videos taken of themselves walking down, completely nude down the street, uh, uh, videos going up of nude women and everyone chuckling and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Do you have any view about Iran? Is more going on there than we think? Is it going to implode? Well, I, I think that in the United States, we're a little bit provincial in looking at all censored societies, starting with China, but certainly Iran as well, because there is this whole other universe going on in expression on the internet. So with Iran, um, and many of these countries, there are several tiers of information. And where you're going to get the most boring and static news is in the official newspaper, because it holds still, and the censors can review it and shut it down. With the internet and with the chat rooms, all kinds of things are happening. A lot of times the government's kind of tolerated because they want a very technologically oriented youth to advance them economically. So they turn a blind eye. Well, that's interesting because if you cut out the youth, they're really cutting off their nose. That's right. Well, let's, let's talk about China. China, in popular perception, is a place which has really tough censorship. The firewalls are hard to beat. Um, the government puts internet whatever bloggers uh, in jail 
Uh, so the picture one would have of China is that it's hopeless. But then when one talks in, to you and sees the things that are going on in the world, one has a different position, uh, impression. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that a lot of the cases we hear about, again, are the high-profile, static cases. Often they're connected with print publications because you, you can have a newspaper in court and hold it up and say, here, they violated it. Um, and I first became aware of this years ago when we were at the Committee to Protect Journalists, where the Chinese said, well, yeah, uh, look at talk radio that anything goes on talk radio because they can't pin it down. So all kinds of dissent was unfolding there. If you look at China now, yeah, some bloggers go to jail. How many bloggers are there in China? If we're not talking about hundreds of thousands, I mean, we, millions. So there, there aren't enough jails to put them all in, and there aren't enough officials to track what they're saying. So it's a very ephemeral environment, um, and it's creating its own sphere of expression. Well, now, how does well, Web 2.0 contains a lot of things. Now, we've been talking about bloggers as a form of, of open communication. We've talked about your website where people are, are gathered. Um, we haven't really talked about Facebook. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Facebook, by the way? Well, again, as a mechanism, it's pretty interesting. Um, and, and it's a form of social networking, so that if I want a limited way of talking to a certain number of people, this is one of many products out there. I used it for teaching. Both you use it for teaching? I teach it, yeah. There's a whole Facebook educators world out there. Wait a minute, how did you use it for teaching? Last semester, I had... I'm going to have to be your friends. How can your pupils be your friends? There's a way to have administrators on site where the students can sign up as a, with another student as the administrator. They don't have to be my friend. Some of them are, but I don't require it. <laughs> so, okay, here we have a site, we have it this semester, where yeah. it's our class, 20 people. Right. And they can post links, they can have dialogue, they can share all kinds of information in a very flexible online environment with great widgets. It really works. You put up photos, you put up video, you put up links. It's very agile. And if I find a better product, I'll use it. But in the meantime, Facebook is working pretty well for these purposes. Well, what's, now, what's wrong with my old fashioned? I'm a teacher too. My old fashioned way is I've got my students on a master email list. Uh -huh. And anytime I want to talk to them, I go button and uh -huh. I get all 12. And when they want to talk to all 15, whatever it is, when they want to talk to their peers, they do the reverse. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that we're all drowning in email. Oh. And our email is, I mean, most people that I know are actually in an email crisis. An email crisis? Yeah. Well, why wouldn't you be in an email crisis on Facebook? Because you, you only... say, okay, it's 3 o'clock, I want to know what's going on with my class. You go to that site and all of the content on that site has to do with your class. And anybody who wants to post anything has only that interaction on that page. So it's very, it creates an efficiency. And if it didn't, it wouldn't be so popular. What, what would they post? Well, for example, the class I have this semester is saying, what makes a good international news website? So people are supposed to be combing the web, and if they find something good, they post the link. So I just posted an article from New Zealand that I thought was a nice design with zippy content, and they're all supposed to look at it. Um, but there are any number of things you can do. You can send messages oh, to everyone so who they, joins. So basically they're a, a group research unit mm -hmm. that seeks useful material, and when they find it, they link it back to, uh, to Facebook. You can do that. You can also have ongoing conversations on different levels. You can communicate with the whole class, part of it. So, so it's just a very uh, agile and efficient way of distributing information to a closed group. One thing that's happened to all of us is that we're getting spammed to death. You know, and we're getting listservs to death. So when you go through your email menu at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's a jumble of information. And what has to happen next on the internet is we have to find a way to clean our closets. What is, the, is Facebook a way of cleaning our closets? Absolutely. 
because I get email from you know, all I over find, the place. I find all this stuff. You know, I've just gotten used to the idea <laughs> of a website. Just gotten used to the idea of cleaning up my email, and uh, I figured out how to use t YouTube, and I really feel I'm with it. And as soon as I get with it. Along comes Web point, uh, 2.0 and everything's all screwed up. Am I going to have to learn all over again? Is everyone going to be on Facebook? What? Are you going to have separate Facebooks? I hope there will be. There already are. So, for example, Google for has a product called Orkut, which is a social networking Facebook-like site that's wildly popular in Brazil. China has its own Facebook products in Chinese. So we don't know the half of it. Um, and you also have relationships that are set up within these. For example, I met somebody in California who works for Linden Labs and is from Oklahoma the way I am just because I had a Facebook site that connected us. So there's all kinds of efficiencies that can happen. Well, can I, let's suppose I'm a uh, Yankee baseball fan, which is hard to imagine. Mm. Um, could I have a Yankee, a Yankee baseball blog, I'm um, not a blog, Facebook for my friends and then also because uh, I like to see your shows on Broadway, have a theater, Facebook for my theater friends, so forth and so on, and then, and then uh, get rid of all the email? Uh, you're not going to get rid of anyway. email immediately, but... But you'd have a centralized... For example, um, I have some great friends in New York who have a show up called In the Heights. It's on I've Broadway. Saw, I've seen it. There's an In the Heights Facebook group where everybody who went to that show and liked it joined. I see. I see. It's up to thousands of members. So it's going to have this huge marketing function. That's controversial. Because one of the things that happened, well, they, they experimented with recently, was saying, uh, you're friends with Jim Goodale, and he just bought a drill press. And his is the brand that he bought. You might want to know it. Well, uh -oh. they don't ask you whether... You, you want to have that information. So the Facebook designers are really treading some difficult ground here with how far they push the marketing side. Is it easy for uh, donos like me to set up Facebook? Absolutely. All I, mean, you need I, is an I, email I will account. confess I have Facebook up, but I haven't figured out how to post my photo yet. Well, you need to ask, you know, a, 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 somebody who's 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> No, they all know it. They all know it. And it's not hard. No, but seriously, on all this, I mean, you're happy with all this stuff. Is it hard for you to do it? Oh, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. But I'm kind of a happy dinosaur. Oops. But what happened was I was teaching this media course last fall, and I said, oh, my God, I have to go on Facebook. My children were horrified. They begged me not to. But I got on, and the first thing it does is go through your address book. Who pops up? My friends teaching at Harvard and Yale and Berkeley. On your Facebook? Yeah, they're already there. And well, these are people teaching microeconomics. How, how can they be already there? You just started your Facebook. How right. do they find you? There is an application that goes through your email address book and says these email oh, addresses oh, are you, already oh, there. Oh, I see. So, oh, you, so you sudden, added all your email people to... It combs it, and you decide who you would like to have in your mix. Now, is this a general mix or just an uh, academic mix in your case? Uh, this I mean, I didn't get an email from you, for example. Well, you, You're on my email list. I'm, right, I'm, but you am weren't... Am I not on your email list? You weren't already on Facebook, apparently. <laughs> yeah, probably, if I know how to open Facebook, you're probably there waiting for me to get back here. Well, and I'm not doing a Facebook ad here, but it Sounds is like worth it knowing about. And, and actually, I'm working with helping to develop a prototype for media lawyers. For media lawyers? Around the world. And you have these poor people in the Ukraine fighting First oh, Amendment. So they can all... So they can all go into a social networking site and say, oh my God, does anybody in Thailand have reference to international law that worked in their court? Oh, I see. Right? So, so think application, not brand. Yeah. Now, uh, what's going on in China well, with Facebook? Yeah. Um, there's a product that I had a student from China last semester who was actually a producer for Central Television, the big... Uh, network there. And she came up with something called the One Kilogram Project on a Chinese version of Facebook where university students sign up for social networking and they all commit to take uh, a kilogram of school supplies in their backpacks for trips into the countryside. Say so that again? Okay, so these are university kids who go do social service work 
in really remote, really poor villages. Right. So if you sign up for this program, you say, okay, I'll throw in some notebooks and pencils into my backpack. Then they go to these poor villages, and it's like an internal Peace Corps. They distribute school supplies, they tutor the kids, they take pictures, they post it on their Facebook site, they post the photographs, they have meetups, so one function of well, this... You want to explain what a meetup is? Well, they will say, everybody who's been in this program and is in Shanghai, get together for a drink on Saturday night. And we'll do a fundraiser for our program. So it's a great way for these students to connect and make a social uh, occasion out of doing public service. Now, do the censors don't get after this? Oh, the sense, the, the, the government oh, loves this, it. Is the, censor taking, is the censors taking down Facebooks? Well, uh, I mean, the Chinese government would love this project because it's, it helps their social programs. And I know, but we can think of examples that the Chinese government wouldn't like. Oh, sure. They'll go after it. But there aren't enough cats for all the mice. So, um, is this going to change the world? It is changing it as we speak. Why is it changing the world? Well, I all, I, all I do is hear about a lot of things I can't use, and I'm perfectly happy to go to the Yankee games or whatever, particularly when they play the Red Sox. Well, what do I need all this stuff for? What am I? What am I? What am I missing? I want. I want you to explain to me what the audience out there is missing by not being on something uh, like Facebook or other forms of show social networking. Well, I'm not, I can't take on your whole audience, but let's take you. You might be able to. Let's take you. <laughs> <laughs> and let's say that you are working with a client that has a really thorny legal case that involves a publication that's distributed in Singapore. And you have an issue around defending the rights of this publication. Um, there may be a group, a very select and intelligent group of lawyers in various countries that know something about this and know the updates in media law and the applicable laws and the briefs. If you have a confidential site where you can share this information in the cause of truth, justice, and, and freedom of the press, this creates a real efficiency. You can do it faster, better, and, you know, with a lot less paper than, than we've been doing things before. So that's one example. There, there are a million ways. Now, there's well, a. What about the average, the average viewer who may not have okay. a particular specialty? Say the average viewer is a, a Yankee fan. Uh huh. What, what, well, what, what would you advise? Let me take you. In my case, I mean, I have been going into groups of my friends of my generation, shall we say. I'm a mom in a parents' association in a school. Our nightmare is scheduling. The student play is Friday. Who's going to sell tickets? Now, the email route. You a million emails, they all get lost, they get crossed in the mail. You set up a social networking site and you say, here's the play, here's the time, we need five volunteers, sign up, and it's all on one page. So it'll change the world as to how you live because it'll make your, I don't like to say it this way, but your social life um, more rewarding and uh, easier to uh, do particularly in a large city, I would suppose, but not. I suppose in the country, it'd even be better. That's argument. the upside. <clears throat> okay, but how is it? <clears throat> how will it change China? How will it change China? Uh, I think that how it is changing China now is that it is another step of loosening the government's control, because already the Chinese educated population is having access to information ways of organizing that is ever more ever farther outside the government control or scrutiny uh, they're just there is so much of this activity there's no way anyone can can track all of it at once <coughs> do you think any of this will pop up in the Olympics I think it already is um, I think that there will be protests that'll be organized. Uh, for you example, think they'll be organized through blogs? Well, <coughs> so the great protests uh, in the old days, <laughs> five years ago, were organized on the net. Yeah. Uh, what you have in a lot of developing countries is leaping over the personal computer stage straight to the cell phone as a convergent handheld computer <coughs> device. 
So for example, in the recent protests in Burma, Myanmar, you had protests organized on cell phone and text messaging. But we're not talking about that here, are we? That, can you have yes. Facebook on a cell phone? Yes, you can. Do you, you, have, uh, do you have one on your cell phone? No, I am a, if I'm a dinosaur on the computer, I'm a troglodyte on, on, on the cell phone. That's okay. <laughs> but, but yes. Um, now, there is a downside, too, because uh, maybe you're in situations like Kenya and the recent violence there where you don't want very rapid organization of violence that can take place potentially through cell phones and text messaging and social networking on that device. Would, would governments use uh, social networking? Yes, absolutely. To, uh, they, they turn it around and, let's say in Kenya, uh, to uh, create a lot of chaos. Could they have kind of a chaos Facebook for just the thugs within the Kenya government? I suppose they could, but actually one of the wonderful students I had last semester was a major general in the army of Singapore. Hmm. Well, what does he think of Facebook? Well, what Singapore, he said... Like, <laughs> do anything wrong in Singapore, you get whipped. Singapore also has some very interesting programs going on in it, and he said that within the institution of the military, if you have waste or corruption going on, you have a way for the lower down personnel to communicate with a hierarchy that used to be impossible. Yeah. What I want to know is when we talk about it changing the world, we're really saying is it going to unseat the powers that be in the countries which are fascist, militaristic, the countries that no one likes. Will it ebb away the foundation, eat away the foundation of these anti-democratic governments and so that the world will really change? It is changing everything and I don't know anyone who sees out far enough to see exactly what the result will be. It's going to eat away at all structures of authority and the first place that has to worry is the news media. Well, we've come to an end. So I take it the answer to the question is Web 2.0 is really going to change the world. It's happening now. Thanks for coming by, Ann. Okay, great, thank you. great pleasure. Thank you for coming by and come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night and have a good week.